let me welcome you to this afternoon's lecture by uh, the Honorable Antoinette Saye, who is Finance Minister in the government of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf in Liberia. My name is Jennifer Widener. For those of you who don't know me, I direct the Vote Center for Peace and Justice, a think tank in the Politics Department, and the Institutions for Fragile States program, a joint endeavor of the Vote Center and the Woodrow Wilson School. I am delighted to be able to introduce our distinguished guest. Dr. Say's accomplishments are many. And before she comes to the, po the podium, I'd like to mention just a few of these and provide a little background to highlight just how impressive she is. In 2006, Dr. Say was appointed Liberia's finance minister, just the second in Liberia's history. Uh, the other woman who served as finance minister was Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, who is now the country's president. Uh, she set the stage for you. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Saya is a graduate of Swarthmore College and earned a PhD in development economics at Tufts University, Fletcher School. She served as an economic advisor in Liberia's Ministry of Finance and Planning after earning her degree, and she then moved to the World Bank, where she worked for 17 years. In that capacity, she was country director for Benin, Togo, and Niger, and she also worked on the management of public finance and civil service reform in Pakistan. She has uh, also served in the office of the bank's managing director and as operations policy vice president. Dr. Say has one of the toughest jobs I can certainly imagine. She took up her current position when Liberia had just emerged from a long period of civil war, surrounded by similarly embattled countries. She had to build the institutions that are central to economic growth and financial management, as well as craft the policies that would help Liberia recover. She has led Liberia through the clearance of its multilateral debt arrears, helped to stabilize its public finances, and championed public financial reform. She has also helped lead an experimental partnership between the government of Liberia and the international community under the umbrella of the governance and management or Economic Management Assistance Program, otherwise known as GMAP. She's going to be speaking about this in Washington tomorrow. Uh, GMAP covers a number of different areas, including ways to secure Liberia's revenue base, improving budgeting and expenditure management, improving procurement practices, corruption control, strengthening the Auditor General, the General Services Agency, and like bodies, and capacity building. The topic of her talk today, however, is not on that subject. It is from foreign student to technocrat to minister, changing perspectives on development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Say. Thank you very much. Uh, should I now turn on the recording? I think I'm supposed to turn this on, even while speaking here at the podium. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Ms. Widener, for those very kind words. Um, I will, as advertised and as you said, uh, speak uh, of my, my own personal experiences as a development professional uh, and give you some re reflections on, on, on my career. But I also wanted to present, first of all, uh, a broad sketch of where Liberia has been and where it is going, uh, particularly in those areas most uh, closely related to the Ministry of Finance and to uh, the economic reconstruction challenge that we're uh, working on in Liberia. As you as you as you're all aware, we've had a, a very troubled past in Liberia. Uh, the April 1980 coup d'état marked the beginning of our steep uh, descent into crisis. A decade of mismanagement uh, and dictatorship uh, that followed led to the outbreak of the Civil War late in uh, 1989 and to 14 subsequent years of chaos, plunder, and violence. All the images you know uh, you associate with Liberia. And all of that did not end until the, the international peacekeepers arrived in 2003 and until we concluded our peace accords in Accra uh, during that year. So the negative consequences of the conflict were enormous. Uh, commercial and productive activities ceased as various warlords uh, looted and vandalized the, the country. Families were shattered. Uh, entire communities were uprooted. 
social, political, economic, and traditional systems of governance uh, were destroyed. There was a massive exodus of skilled uh, and talented inv individuals from, uh, from the country. Uh, the economy completely collapsed. GDP fell a catastrophic 90% between 1987 and 1995, one of the largest economic collapses uh, ever recorded. And by the time of the elections in 2005 that brought uh, President uh, Sirleaf to power, um, average income in Liberia was just one quarter of what it had been in 1987 and just one sixth of its level in 1979. So that was our inheritance, and today, after decades of economic mismanagement and 14 years of uh, that uh, brutal past, uh, we think our national nightmare is over. There are risks, of course, but we think it is, it is indeed over. The country has been at peace since 2003. We've had, uh, with the two rounds of uh, elections in 2005, uh, leading to President Sirleaf's uh, government uh, coming into office in January of 2006, the economy has been uh, uh, recovering, expanding, uh, growth has accelerated, uh, uh, roads and buildings are being uh, rebuilt, health clinics and schools are reopening, and agricultural production is increasing. And the government is introducing a broad set of uh, policies to foster peace, accelerate reconstruction and development, and build strong systems of governance. Most importantly, hope has been restored. While many challenges lie ahead, uh, Liberians are optimistic about the future for the first time in decades. There is a long way to go, but uh, Liberia has launched its recovery and is poised for rapid, inclusive, and sustainable development in the years to come. In the past two years, uh, the government has introduced a range of steps to overhaul uh, our financial management systems and to spur renewed uh, economic activity, some of those in the context of GMAP uh, that you mentioned. Uh, you said I wouldn't uh, talk very much about these issues, but I think it's important to, uh, to of course, uh, say uh, something about them to appreciate uh, some of the challenges uh, one is dealing with in a professional career as a development professional as well in those circumstances. Um, the government has made strong progress on dealing with its debt situation, which we've spent a lot of time on in the last, uh, uh, last couple of years. Uh, we formulated and began implementing a comprehensive domestic debt resolution strategy we cleared, we've just recently cleared our long-standing arrears to the World Bank, to the African Development Bank, and most recently to the IMF, and have just uh, signed a new three-year agreement with the, with the fund, and have reached a decision point under the Highly Indebted Poor Countries, or HIPIC, initiative. Uh, when we uh, came into office in uh, early 2006, uh, revenue uh, was only about $84 million, uh, this is for a country of uh, some 3.4 million people and uh, a country in which uh, revenues had before the war been five times uh, that level. In the current uh, fiscal year, which ends in June, the revenue envelope will reach approximately 200 million. So we've been able to more than double revenues in the last uh, two years, uh, much of it through a, a robust uh, uh, effort to strengthen revenue administration, none of it through increasing any taxes. Uh, uh, but just uh, closing the loopholes that they were in, in the system. Uh, we've been focused on those uh, initial efforts at stabilization and clearance of our arrears, uh, all of that to clear the, uh, the way, if you will, for a much more focused uh, 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 attention to the development and reconstruction issues that are uh, mammoth in Liberia. Uh, now, Part of our strategy over the medium term is to reach the HIPIC completion point, uh, at which time uh, debt relief uh, becomes irrevocable, as you know, and uh, thus we to truly move beyond uh, this point and this chapter in our history. This will allow us to ultimately uh, access uh, more financial resources for our, for our development uh, and remove the debt overhang, uh, which currently casts a very large shadow on our economy and on uh, uh, foreign investment. Uh, we have successfully implemented two staff monitored, uh, IMF staff monitored programs under which we have made significant improvements in public finances and in monetary and exchange rate policies, which have paved, paved the way to fully uh, restoring relations with the IMF, as I said, we've just done uh, just last month. 
Uh, we also joined the Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative to strengthen accountability and transparency in managing funds generated through uh, our natural resource-based activities. Uh, as uh, those of you who are familiar with Liberia's economic history uh, perhaps know, uh, we were famous for, for being characterized as a, a, a case of growth without development, coming out of our very robust growth in the 60s and 70s from natural resources, but a failure uh, to have that growth impact uh, the lives of average li uh, Liberians in a good way. Uh, that we, uh, we are uh, uh, going to uh, change. We are committed to changing the impact of natural resources on, on, uh, on uh, our economy and society, and for that, the EITI, as we call it, is, is a useful uh, instrument. And to further strengthen our financial management, the government uh, has submitted a, a series of legislation uh, to the legislature, uh, including to, to limit the extent to which the executive is able uh, on its own to make changes to the approved budget. Uh, to begin the revitalization of uh, key economic activities, the government in early 2006 uh, immediately canceled all forestry contracts and reviewed uh, some 95 uh, or so contracts that were granted by the previous government. Uh, we subsequently passed a new forestry law uh, to strengthen the oversight and regulation of the forestry sector. Uh, I think you, you are all familiar, uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, our history with uh, the role of forestry uh, in fueling the war, uh, the use of forest uh, resources to, to uh, purchase arms and all of the, the bad uh, history from forestry. Uh, we have a very, uh, very demanding new forestry law in that regard, one that uh, reflects uh, the need to, uh, to, to learn from that experience and to manage uh, the forest sector in a much different way. So it has very demanding uh, provisions in, in the way of how we award new forestry contracts and uh, demanding provisions in terms of our protection of our, uh, our forest resources and our participation of uh, local communities in uh, forest uh, resource development. Um, so those are, those are some of the steps uh, uh, that uh, led uh, in the last uh, year, a uh, year and a half, to the lifting of sanctions, uh, of, uh, UN sanctions against Liberia, both on forestry and also on uh, diamond. Uh, uh, those have been lifted, and we're therefore in a position to, to recover uh, uh, growth and, and uh, prospects for development in those uh, two sec sectors. Uh, as some of you may also know, we spent uh, some time renegotiating a very important iron ore agreement uh, when we first uh, took office uh, with ArcelorMittal Steel, uh, the, fir the first uh, iron ore agreement in many, many years in Liberia, one that should uh, enable us to expand iron ore ex uh, production, to begin to resume iron ore production and to start exporting iron ore again in 2010. Uh, more importantly, we've, we've worked uh, to, uh, we're beginning to work in the context of those uh, uh, those agreements, the ArcelorMittal one, the, the recent one renegotiated with Firestone, uh, to try to work at better linkages between the extractive industry sector and uh, the rest of the economy, uh, including uh, uh, the, the role of small and medium enterprises uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in maximizing the, the linkages from the extractive industry sector. We've, uh, we have worked to increase employment throughout the country. Um, through, through a number of, of areas, but uh, employment uh, remains a huge challenge in Liberia, uh, given the, the, the lack of economic activity these many years and uh, the, the very initial uh, growth spurts that are coming uh, broadly uh, from the donor sector and uh, uh, not so, so much yet from uh, private uh, investment and uh, private investment giving a way to uh, more sustainable job creation. So we have a big challenge in the way of uh, unemployment. We have many young people uh, on the streets still uh, without uh, very much to do. Uh, but we have just completed in that context uh, a full uh, first poverty reduction strategy for Liberia, which lays uh, out our vision for, for, how, for accelerating growth and for making that growth more inclusive and sustainable. In developing that strategy, we carried out a consultative process that was more participatory uh, than any other uh, 
process in, 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 in the country's history with meetings in every district as well as uh, all counties and at the regional level across Liberia. The process also uh, solicited and incorporated uh, contributions from the legislature, the judiciary, of course civil society, the private sector, and our development partners. We are now in the process of uh, making that uh, PRS, uh, we are going to start making it widely available and of course moving on with the challenges of starting to implement it. Uh, moving forward, we know that we have to build a, a strong economy with r robust uh, employment growth, uh, widespread opportunities for all our citizens, and a much more uh, vibrant private sector. Uh, we think it is only through increased incomes and coupled with access to improved health and education services that the poorest Liberians can gain the foothold to work their way out of poverty. The government wants to build an open and competitive economy sustained by strong international trade linkages and significant local and uh, foreign private investment. And in that context has a three-pronged uh, growth strategy that we've laid out in the PRS that, uh, uh, that deals with uh, rebuilding roads. Uh, roads are very important from, from uh, uh, several perspectives. Uh, the second prong of our strategy is revitalizing the traditional engines of growth. I've been speaking about that. And lastly, uh, to begin to establish a competitive business environment uh, to help to de diversify the economy over the, the medium term. Uh, but uh, the, first, uh, uh, the first focus of our, our growth strategy is to rebuild infrastructure, and particularly roads. Uh, the power reduction strategy, uh, the consultative process around that revealed across the country like that Liberia's number one priority is uh, better roads. Uh, everyone saw roads as essential for creating jobs and new economic opportunities, for revitalizing agriculture, reducing prices, uh, strengthening local governance, facilitating access to health and education services, and connecting the population to service centers, e increasing the effectiveness of the police and security forces, and helping to maintain peace. Our second, uh, second focus is that we must uh, revive those traditional uh, engines of growth, rubber, timber, mining, cash crops, uh, and ensure uh, stronger linkages with the rest of the economy. And uh, I've talked about uh, the, the focus on uh, making sure that small and medium enterprises uh, uh, benefit in that process. Uh, the government is working very hard to revitalize agriculture as the bedrock of the economy. Uh, we think agriculture, of course, provides the, uh, the biggest prospects for a widespread uh, job creation and uh, improved livelihoods for uh, most Liberians. The government will continue uh, to take strong steps to diversify uh, the economy in the medium term. We think in the, in the short term, of course, there's a lot we can do to maximize uh, the benefits uh, from our natural resources and to, to use them in a much, much more sustainable way. And we are certainly working on, on, on that. But clearly, uh, uh, natural resource-based uh, 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 growth and development has limitations. Uh, uh, we're, we're familiar with many of them uh, in terms of uh, you know, Dutch disease and the, the, the impact of, of uh, focus on natural resource uh, production. Another sector of, of the economy, the bad governance that has historically been associated with uh, natural resource-based uh, uh, growth and development. So we think uh, uh, that it's also important to diversify uh, the economy, and we, uh, to do so, of course, means that we need to work uh, uh, very hard on improving the business environment and to incre increasing the incentives for investment in other sectors. So uh, those are some of the things uh, we're, we're doing. In all of these activities, the private sector uh, will uh, be the main driver of growth, at it, as has been historically in Liberia. Uh, but we think that uh, while attracting foreign investment is critical to growing the economy, uh, our aim also has to be to empower domestic entrepreneurs uh, to conduct business and create jobs for others and to thereby uh, grow the size and purchasing power of the Liberian middle class. And that is uh, uh, the subject of quite a bit of uh, debate in Liberia currently, the relative uh, focus on foreign versus domestic uh, investment in whether the, the government is doing uh, as much as it ought to to encourage uh, domestic investment. But we think that they're not, uh, they're not mutually exclusive, and uh, we think the, the broad uh, focus on improving the overall investment
climate and leveling uh, uh, the playing field is good for both domestic and potential foreign investors. So uh, the government uh, will, will continue to focus on those areas that uh, the private sector uh, cannot and will not offer at an appropriate price. Those, of course, uh, traditional public uh, goods, safety, security, rule of law, providing infrastructure and basic uh, other uh, public goods. Uh, but we know that economic growth alone is not uh, enough. Um, the process across uh, Liberia revealed a, a significant importance that Liberians attach to improved education and health services, uh, of course, as well as to employment opportunities. In our context, of course, where we've had a, a whole generation of Liberians uh, not uh, have the opportunity to go to school, uh, increasing enrollment rates and giving uh, uh, an opportunity uh, to, to uh, improve the quality of education is a big priority for us. And we're focusing uh, quite a bit of our efforts around education and improved educational opportunities. Um, of course, across Liberia, uh, people continue to suffer from very bad health that impedes their, their ability to engage and to benefit from economic opportunities. And so a focus on health is also uh, important, as is training to give people the ability to uh, benefit from the new emerging opportunities in the economy. Uh, in addition to promoting prosperity and improving the delivery of basic services, the government is also determined to help Liberians move beyond the divisions of, uh, of the past and establish the foundations for responsible institutions of justice, human rights, and governance. We are working to build uh, an inclusive and highly participatory democracy with strong systems of governance uh, in which rights are respected, people are engaged in the governance process, institutions serve the public good, and natural resources are used for the benefit of all of our people. Uh, that is our vision, but uh, significant challenges remain to realizing that vision in Liberia. Uh, the depth of the report of the proposed reform agenda that we've set out is also <clears throat> such that uh, its implementation uh, requires the uh, trust and cooperation on the part of uh, an opposition-dominated legislature, and that's one of our, our big ch challenges, how, how to deepen the reform program uh, amidst uh, significant differences of views on uh, what are the appropriate directions uh, for reform in Liberia. and. Uh, an opposition-dominated legislature that has very different views about uh, what ought to be done and a uh, very different role also, uh, stemming from some of the role of some of uh, the participants in the legislature currently uh, uh, in the past uh, history of Liberia. So those are some of the challenges. Uh, our revenues currently are, are, despite the fact that we've more than doubled them in these last two years, they're only still a fraction of what, uh, what we need for our ambitious reform and development program over the next uh, several years. As such, we continue to be extremely dependent on external uh, financing, uh, leading to the challenges of donor coordination felt by all countries in our region and talked about, I'm sure, in, uh, in, in this basement in, in, uh, and in your, uh, your classes in the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, one challenge which may not get enough attention uh, is the need to attract quality personnel to rebuild the decimated human capital uh, of our government institutions. I manage a ministry of finance where uh, my deputy ministers sometimes do uh, basic data entry and worry about whether the elevator is working or not in order to make sure people get to important meetings. Uh, we have to do much more to strengthen the middle level civil servants, middle and lower level civil servants, to allow those with the capacity to, the capacity and responsibility to think strategically and lead our uh, development, uh, to allow them the space to do so. On the streets of Monrovia, uh, threats continue to exist with large numbers of uneducated, unemployed, and marginalized youth, as I said before. Uh, many of them susceptible to being recruited back into conflict. And there are many unresolved issues with respect to land. Land potentially is uh, uh, a future source of conflict in Liberia, and we're uh, cognizant of that and working uh, to start to address the, the many issues around uh, land uh, that divide Liberians currently. 
these are threats. Uh, these threats are particularly salient given that the UN mission in Liberia, or UNMIL as it is called, is expected to begin its draw drawdown uh, during the poverty reduction uh, period that is in the next uh, two to uh, three years. So we need to do more to ensure that progress on issues like debt and uh, and revenues uh, are translated into concrete substantive improvements in the lives of average uh, Liberians, so that uh, Liberians see uh, that the, the progress uh, that uh, we're making on the reform agenda actually impacts their lives. And that's possibly our greatest challenge uh, currently, how to translate uh, some of what we're doing quickly enough into jobs, into uh, uh, better standards of living uh, for, for our people. Uh, let me now turn a little bit to uh, more personal reflections on, on some of this. I've talked a lot about what uh, what we're doing as a government in Liberia, but uh, to be tr uh, true to uh, truth in advertisement, I think I should uh, say a little bit about my own perspective on these things. Um, when I was in high school uh, initially, uh, and as I began my undergraduate studies at Swarthmore, Liberia was, uh, was among the most prosperous countries in West Africa at the time. Uh, there were often missions from Ghana uh, visiting regularly to learn uh, from our best practices. Uh, the JFK uh, airport uh, in New York was only a nonstop uh, Pan Am flight away. Um, those were uh, the images that uh, one grew up with in Liberia uh, in, the, in the 70s. Uh, 60s and 1970s. I left Liberia to gain an education uh, to, to use uh, ultimately in service uh, to my country. This was certainly in any case my parents' vision of why they were giving me the educational opportunities they were fortunate to, to give me. When I graduated and returned uh, to Liberia, I met a, a very different country. Uh, uh, this was uh, in the, the 19, uh, early, 19, early to mid 1980s, uh, during the Doe regime, uh, the first uh, military regime in Liberia's history. Uh, it, during that time, of course, making a, a contribution to Liberia uh, was a, a difficult one, uh, was a very difficult one, to, uh, if not uh, an impossible task to make as a, as a te technician. One could not, in fact, be an honest technician without running afoul of the mostly um, uh, avaricious politics of the day. Uh, the timing for making a technical contribution in Liberia was just, it was just not the time to do so. Um, so after three years after graduate school, uh, I, uh, I joined the World Bank. And as, an, uh, as an, a young undergraduate, uh, before, before that time, of course, I had felt uh, in my days at Swarthmore as did many of my stu uh, fellow students at the bank and the IMF were part of what was wrong with development. Big, faceless institutions full of bureaucrats pushing paper between departments and promoting the interests of the rich countries over those of the poor. That was our vision of what the World Bank and IMF were at the time. But I also, uh, after that, I mean, subsequently spent uh, a summer at the bank, uh, a summer at the fund, uh, during my graduate school years, and I think in that process discovered that inside those institutions, frankly, there are many good, earnest, hardworking people trying to help along uh, reforms and development, uh, however uh, narrow-mindedly or, uh, you know, uh, limited by their own institutions in doing so. Uh, for a decade and a half at the World Bank, uh, more than a decade and a half, some 17 years of my career was spent at the bank, ultimately. I worked on a number of countries and corporate issues. Uh, I was uh, a country director, as, as, uh, as you heard. I went on mission, uh, as we call it at the, at the bank and IMF, going on mission. It's, it sounds like a religious experience, but <laughs> it's actually part of uh, what makes for putting together these uh, programs that we support. And so going on mission is a big part of our work as, as professionals at the bank. But uh, I went on these missions, sitting across from governments uh, with varying commitments to reform. Sometimes I was frustrated with the pace of reform from my World Bank perspective, wanting things to move more quickly in our dialogue with uh, various countries. But of course now I, I see it very differently as a minister uh, leading my country's own reform efforts and seeing the issues from the other side. 
we sometimes feel, of course, that our development partners, uh, while well-meaning, are pushing too hard, often oblivious of political constraints. Uh, it's all too easy to be wrapped up in the internal mechanics of one's own in institution. And uh, I think having sat on both sides, it's, it's, it's fair to say that one must uh, really stretch to see uh, the other side of, 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 the, of, the, of the table. As minister, I see many donor missions come through, uh, through my office. Uh, while many of these meetings do ultimately promote our reform agenda, some stem rather from the agenda of particular groups of individuals promoting their own careers. Uh, it's, uh, it's important when you go on these missions to say that you've seen the Minister of Finance and to say that the Minister of Finance is supportive of whatever project you think is important to your career to have approved. So that's part of what, uh, what happens uh, to Ministers of Finance in, in countries like mine uh, that are uh, working hard to reestablish relations with uh, uh, the international financial institutions. You end up seeing a lot of people, many of, many of them you probably don't need to see. Uh, but you end up seeing a lot of them because it, it, uh, you think that you have to sometimes. Um, but, you know, some of the agendas that come our way are always, uh, you know, some of them are ultimately uh, worthwhile. Uh, but the challenge of handling all the various queries that go with, uh, with these missions, uh, providing basic information that uh, uh, can often be uh, obtained, frankly, uh, just by themselves talking to their colleagues from within the institution, it takes a lot of time a lot of limited, uh, limited capacity uh, that we have. Uh, at the bank, of course, uh, one's, uh, one's work is primarily technical and sometimes strategic in thinking about broad reforms. Uh, in my current job, as I work to lead implementation of, uh, of, of the reform program, I work not by providing advice and technical assistance, but uh, through the long, hard, day-to-day -day work of pushing the ball forward in an environment where politics, uh, politics abound. Uh, politics is the, is the constant in our environment. Uh, so the questions I ask myself these, uh, these days are tactical for the most part. Uh, they involve asking what are the right trade-offs? Uh, where should I stand firm? Or where should I compromise? When is compromise uh, too much? Uh, is this, is this uh, the, too much of a compromise and how does one step back and retain the integrity of the, of the reform effort? while at the same time uh, uh, dealing with the political constraints. At the bank, of course, uh, you can bet on particular countries and reform efforts and take chances in seizing opportunities to influence countries. And in, in many ways, that's what makes an institution like the, the World Bank a special one. Uh, the leverage that an institution like that has with poor countries gives you, as a professional in that environment, an opportunity to influence, and to influence in a way that is uh, probably uh, uh, not correct, frankly, because it, it gives to young, uh, well-meaning professionals an uh, inordinate amount of influence, uh, influence that is sometimes dangerous, because uh, we, we've all uh, uh, learned that, uh, I mean, youth has is, is uh, positive things, but uh, wisdom in terms of, uh, uh, you know, tactical issues and uh, when to take on political challenges or not, it's not, it's not among the things that uh, youth is known for. So it can be <laughs> dangerous to have youth with that sort of uh, political influence and it, uh, leverage in, in relationships between an institution like the bank and, and countries like ours. Um, so, you know, what, what, is the right, what is the right mix of, 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 uh, of uh, perspectives when one comes from uh, a background that has seen uh, the professional, uh, professional uh, sort of uh, opportunities that a place like the bank uh, affords, uh, affords one with the, 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 the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to actually influence and to make a difference in an environment like ours, uh, with, uh, with a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity to change Liberia and to do things differently under uh, visionary leadership of President Sirleaf and to, to have an opportunity to, to really contribute. Um, that's, that's where I am in my career. Uh, I left uh, 17 years uh, working uh, at the bank to take a, a, a chance, in a way, on, on leadership. And it is, uh, it is a leadership that is uh, the, the best leadership we've had uh, in Liberia's history. 
is an opportunity to really uh, make a difference. And for that reason, one one uh, you know, makes a big decision to leave a long-term career at a place uh, like the bank that has all of the protections of of uh, uh, technical support and and uh, institutional uh, an institutional framework that clear one for for getting one's work done to work in a place that has no such support, very little in the way of that support, a lot of uh, uh, huge demands on your day-to-day -day, uh, day -day efforts, uh, no personal life, no uh, extra sleep, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, constant donor, uh, donor demands on your time. Uh, but what an opportunity, what an opportunity to help change things in Liberia. We, uh, we are privileged to be given uh, opportunities like those. And, uh, uh, it is among the best decisions I've made in, in my, my own professional life to take that risk on, on, uh, on, on things in Liberia and to, to throw in the towel, if you will, to a, a career at the World Bank and to, to try a career on the other side. And it is, it is exhilarating uh, and uh, rewarding in, in what we've been able to, uh, to accomplish these last couple of years. It's a huge road ahead. Uh, in terms of uh, making sure Liberia does not revert to, uh, to where it came from. Uh, but uh, we think we've made some progress. And, uh, uh, you know, the, one of the things that uh, we, we, we work with uh, uh, so little is time. Uh, we, we don't have very much time to, to get things done. Uh, we have very little uh, human capital to accomplish things. Uh, I never thought enough about time when I worked at a place like the bank, but in Liberia we literally do not uh, have time to think about the next month's problems. Uh, we focus instead on next week's or tomorrow's problems. Sometimes I worry that all I'm doing is fighting fires uh, rather than pushing uh, uh, the reform effort forward with, with long-term vision. Uh, I see many changes that have occurred in the past few years and realize that, of course, this is not the case. We're making progress, but uh, it is true that the sense of just-in-time delivery and the vast number of urgent problems to be addressed is something I never experienced at a place like the World Bank. Uh, one of the things I've come to realize about partner engagement in uh, a developing country context, from my experience both inside and outside of government, is that people matter. Uh, for all of the talk of systems and institutions, the quality of personnel representing development partners, both in the field and at headquarters, is absolutely critical to success. Perhaps the first quality of a good partner, uh, a good development partner, is the ability to engage in productive dialogue uh, with the government. Uh, it's not about supervising uh, governments, as sometimes is said at places like the bank, but rather rolling up your sleeves and actually helping out uh, in a practical way, in a day-to-day -day basis. And perhaps the most important trait uh, is flexibility, asking uh, not what is in my terms of reference as country manager, but rather how can I help uh, to take forward uh, uh, the reform effort. Um, the answer to that uh, latter question, how a partner can best help, is, I believe, to provide constructive advice uh, and to ultimately um, roll up one's sleeves and to, to, to help in a, practical, in a practical way on a day-to-day -day basis with promoting reforms and the reformers in whatever way one can. And of course, I, I spoke earlier about the importance of strong uh, leadership, leadership in the, in the way that we have uh, in our president, but of course, leadership uh, more broadly uh, in the government and its relationships with, uh, with partners. Um, it, is, it is absolutely critical uh, to any success in the development area to have strong leadership and one that uh, sets a clear goal uh, and, and lays out a path to achieve that. We have a unique opportunity with that uh, uh, in Liberia currently, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy uh, to, uh, to be a part of uh, an ability to, to, to leverage that leadership uh, for uh, changing Liberia. With that, I'd like to thank you uh, for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, either about Liberia's reform uh, program or about my own experience as a, as a development ex uh, professional. Thank you.
So you might want to, to stay there. Open it to questions. The Princeton rule is students get to go first. Um, if you don't have questions, I have plenty. So, um, we have about half an hour, maybe a little bit more, I think. Um, and if you would identify yourself uh, when you have a question, you recognize it would be helpful. Uh, yes. My name is Mark Christopher. I'm a second year master's student here at the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, I'm in, thank you so much thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, in your talk, you touched on Liberia's continued need for external financing, on EITI, mm -hmm. um, and on the need for donor coordination. I hope that might draw you out a little bit further on Liberia's relations with other countries. Specifically, uh, what is your vision and your government's vision for the future of Liberia's special relationship with the United States? particularly given that uh, priorities in Washington and in Monrovia may not always be the same. And I would also be very curious to hear your answer to the same question with regards to China. OK, that's a very, very good question. Uh, we've had a very long relationship, as you, as you know, with, uh, with, the, with the United States. And in fact, in the, in the last couple of years, we've had a very productive relationship uh, uh, with uh, with uh, with the U.S. government, that uh, the U.S. Uh, has been at the forefront of uh, the debt relief efforts for Liberia, working very hard to mobilize the support among shareholders in IMF and World Bank, and uh, within the G8 uh, about uh, raising the the resources needed to clear our arrears and provide debt relief to Liberia, and has also provided bilateral, significant bilateral uh, assistance uh, to Liberia. Uh, a key partner in, in GMAP, of course, the U.S. Uh, has been there supporting public financial management reforms and uh, the broad range of, of efforts on, on the development uh, side. Uh, we fully expect that we'll continue to have a, 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 a big relationship, a deep relationship with the U.S. It's our most important bilateral relationship. It, it always has been. It's gone through ups and downs. Uh, there was a time when Liberians felt uh, 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 abandoned by the U.S. Uh, uh, many Liberians saw themselves as, in a way, a special, special uh, relationship for the U.S. and Africa, given uh, that uh, many Liberians came, uh, their ancestors came from the U.S. and the long relationship we had. Uh, and many Liberians, uh, likewise, were very, very encouraged by the efforts made by the U.S. in 2003 to help uh, restore peace to Liberia, and since then, in helping to nurture that peace. Uh, so it's a complicated relationship sometimes. Of course, we, uh, we, we sometimes feel that uh, given the, the level of uh, uh, stri strategic relationship we've had with the U.S. in the past, that uh, there are times when we feel that we're not getting as much in the way of support, financial support, as that relationship would, would warrant. Uh, but having said all of that, of course, I think Liberians, uh, as a result of the war and as a result of that feeling of being abandoned, are increasingly aware that uh, it will. T uh, I mean, that we have to rely on our own resources. That uh, uh, the deepest friendships with the deepest, with the with the strongest uh, superpowers, uh, don't make for uh, for your own uh, uh, control over your own uh, uh, your own uh, destiny, and that Liberians need to forge. Uh, a greater, a greater ownership of their own uh, uh, destiny, and to to uh, really look internally also about uh, how can we leverage our own resources to support our efforts at uh, at development. And China, uh, in that context, uh, provides a lot of uh, possible uh, uh, lessons for Liberia. We think I mean, there's a China's a huge success with lifting millions of people out out of poverty. It's an inspiration to a lot of people. In, in, including in Liberia. Um, uh, the Chinese uh, are, are very present in Liberia and very active, uh, very, uh, very strong partner uh, on a number of uh, things, uh, certainly with a big interest in infrastructure, and infrastructure is a big interest of ours, but also across the board in helping us rebuild uh, infrastructure at the University of Liberia, in, uh, in helping uh, do uh, many things and doing them in a much more flexible way than our traditional partners have been able to do in uh, responding much quicker than uh, some of our traditional partners uh, have, uh, have been able to do. We've, uh, we are, of course, constrained in what we can uh, do with, uh, uh, the, the, uh, with China in terms of the resources being made available. We are, because of our debt, 
uh, overhang uh, and uh, the level of, of, of that debt and the, the burden of that debt. Uh, we're not in a position to borrow even on a concessional basis in the next uh, a couple of years, so we can't even uh, benefit from very concessional financing at this stage. And in that context, some of the additional resources that uh, the Chinese government can make available to us, we're not currently in a position to, to use. So with those constraints, uh, that uh, you know, uh, limits what we, can, what we can do with the Chinese. But we've, uh, we've had uh, a lot of uh, technical assistance and support uh, in, in, a, in a number of areas with people uh, being brought to China to to learn and to be exposed to, to uh, experiences there. And we're, we're encouraged by that partnership, that emerging partnership. We're encouraged also uh, that uh, China is, is, is uh, engaged, is increasingly engaged in the dialogue with the broader donor community on the ground in Liberia. So it's not as if the, uh, the Chinese are uh, uh, operating on a separate uh, dialogue of their own, but it's increasingly getting getting into the, uh, the broader donor dialogue, and we find that uh, encouraging. Sorry, can I just ask a clarification? Yes. Why, why can't you borrow from the Chinese? Why are you not? Well, uh, we, we've uh, committed ourselves in the context of the program we have uh, yeah. with IMF and, uh, to uh, not borrow uh, for the next uh, uh, couple of years until we, we clear the, the, the debt overhang that we have and okay. until we at least reach the HIPAA completion point. And so we are, in that context, uh, limited by what we can, what we can do. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is Alexandra. I come from Romania. I'm a junior in the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, you mentioned how you managed to more than double the government revenues from 84 to $200 million, uh, not by raising taxes, but by through other methods. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on, on what kind of methods uh, you did that whether it was bringing the informal economy out or, or anything else? Well, I, um, I should say uh, first that uh, our, our revenue base is, is heavily dominated by import taxes. Uh, about 50% uh, of, our, of our revenues come from uh, taxes on imports. Uh, we were able to, and uh, historically, under invoicing of imports to avoid paying uh, uh, legitimate taxes has been uh, widespread. Uh, so very early on in uh, our administration, we strengthened uh, a system of pre-ship and inspection of imports uh, that, it, that helps us to get at the under-invoicing problem and has been uh, instrumental in significantly increasing the revenues from uh, import taxes. So that's uh, one way uh, that we've, we've been able to uh, to, to, uh, to help it, to increase revenues. Another, another is on the corporate income sa side. We've had a significant increase in corporate income taxes in the last couple of years uh, through a program, a much more rigorous program of, of auditing also of uh, corporate uh, income tax returns. And uh, so those two, those two areas uh, and, uh, are probably the biggest source of the, of the increase in, in revenues uh, from tax administration efforts, from efforts to strengthen tax administration. Uh, in the years ahead, uh, we want to start the process now of, of starting to reduce uh, tax rates uh, because that, we, we see that as extremely important to improving our competitiveness in the region and uh, to uh, improving the environment for, for private investment. So we're, we've just uh, recently uh, uh, submitted and we're going to be submitting additional legislation to that effect. Um, just no, no, we don't. We have a corporate income tax rate of 35% that we want to reduce to 30% and uh, the individual income tax rate of 30% as well that we, uh, we're we going to be reducing. Yeah. And then, so thank you for coming. My name is John Gandomi. I'm a second year master's student at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, I was very interested to hear what you have to say about uh, the international community, particularly the develop, uh, development field, World Bank, experience as a development expert. Uh, what other priorities of the international community do you think are misguided for Liberia? You, you, you kind of hinted at the uh, issue of uh, borrowing um, and, and, whether, and whether or not that may actually be the most uh, appropriate constraint that should be on Liberia right now. Can you give us some other specific examples of what priorities that may not be the best uh, fit for Liberia, but rather are perhaps being pursued because of uh, commitments of certain theoretical principles 
And if you have a story, perhaps you can illustrate. <laughs> Let me, let me say that I think broadly uh, our, our own perspective on what needs to be done in Liberia and those of the, of the donor community are broadly aligned. Uh, so we, I, you know, we, we think in many ways that Liberia has actually been at the, at the source of its own problems and that Liberia itself has to change and has to change in a, fundamentally, in a fundamental way. So we, we need to change the way we do things in Liberia. And, in that, in that way, I think uh, we're, we're broadly aligned with the international community, which has had a big focus, for example, on issues of corruption, uh, corruption in the way we've managed natural resources, corruption. So uh, we, we have a lot that we share in common. I think the, the questions about pace and, and focus is, is what, what I was trying to, to get at, in a way, and, and time, timing of, of, of how quickly one can get things done in a context like ours. Um, I think those are the issues we, we, we talk about. And of course, the, the huge demand on, on limited capacity uh, to service the donors, uh, to service them in a way uh, that goes, ar I mean, goes around our budget, of course. Uh, all of the resources, most of the resources being channeled to Liberia are outside of our budget or through uh, NGOs or uh, through the UNDP or other uh, non governmental uh, sources. And so they're there are issues to do with, uh, you know, uh, how, how that uh, affects our capacity to, to align uh, what the donors are doing to our own priorities. So alignment on, in terms of the focus of donor uh, efforts uh, and our own uh, is an issue that we, we talk uh, about. Um, there, uh, there, there are certainly uh, problems that we've experienced in the last couple of years from the, how slow donors are, and that's perhaps one of the b biggest frustrations we've had in these last two years, uh, uh, the, the really, really lengthy procedures and processes and time it takes to get basic procurement done, to get basic things, get basic answers to basic questions from, from donors. And uh, so that's, that's a lot of, but I would, I would not say that we've had huge differences of views on, <laughs> on the direction of policy. Uh, there are times when we, we have some differences. They're not large enough, I think, to, uh, to say that we're on different uh, different wavelengths. I'm, yes. um, I'm a freshman, so very young, very naive. <laughs> 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 uh, from Madagascar. Um, I had a question about the African Union and uh, what you thought about its place in terms of the development uh, framework for Africa, whether it actually can have some hope in it or whether it still has um, a long way to go, and especially like, in terms of Liberia. Well, I think I think the AU has come some ways uh, in the, in the last uh, several years. Uh, there was a time when when the AU was called the OAU at the time when uh, no one expected anything from from the Organization of African Unity except uh, uh, you know propping up uh, uh, unpopular dictators. And that was the image of the OAU, I think, in in Africa itself and outside. Uh, that image has been transformed uh, significantly uh, by the efforts of the AU, I think, itself to to really forge a, a consensus around uh, African development issues and to, 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 to map out a role for African institutions, regional institutions, in, in, uh, in the development process. Among, among them, of course, NAPAD and the, uh, the focus on, on improved governance that the AU has tried to promote. Uh, so I think that has been a positive, a positive direction for the AU there. Uh, there's uh, there's a lot in the way of uh, attention to infrastructure, for example, that uh, NAPAD and uh, efforts from the AU have brought that are helpful uh, to the to the broader development process. Uh, there there are institutions, of course, uh, uh, of the AU and uh, that are related to the AU that are a better place, I think, in terms of the development agenda to help on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis with with some of the development challenges. Among them. Uh, you know the, um, uh, the economic community for uh, Africa and, and others that are helping and to work on development challenges. But I think the AU is in a very different place uh, than it was before. Uh, there's still questions of how effectively it can it can be brought to intervene uh, uh, in places, for example, like Zimbabwe and some of the, the the challenges that we've had there on the on the political and governance front. But uh, it's certainly a, a better institution, I think, than it was uh, in the past, and it has a, a, a better uh, future. 
Now, uh, all of these institutions, I think, are only as good as the leadership uh, from the countries that, <laughs> that, uh, that, uh, that uh, are part of those institutions. And I think increasingly across Africa, we've seen better leadership, uh, better political leadership uh, that has been emerging. And so there's, uh, there's uh, hope there from that. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you also for coming. Um, my name is Alex. I'm a third year in the history department here. Um, and I'm wondering if I could push you a little bit further on the question of linkages that you identified, linkages between the extractive industries, timber, iron ore, et cetera, um, and what you referred to as small and medium-sized businesses in the country. Um, and I think you know, we've all heard you lay out the sort of balance sheet um, and the different sorts of obligations the Liberian government will have in terms of training programs, schools, hospitals, jobs, yeah. you can go down the list. Um, and so it seems to me that, that revenue from these small and medium-sized businesses is going to take up in the, in the medium term, maybe the long term, uh, will help uh, on the positive side of the balance sheet. Um, but it's also, it seems to me, critical for issues of unemployment and for incorporation of more people into the formal economy. So I'm curious, what, what do you mean by linkages? What are the specific kinds of mechanisms that, that your ministry and the government are generally is thinking about? Yeah, no, um, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a very good question. I think there, there, there may be several aspects to it. One is the sort of the relative balance, I guess, between uh, uh, taxation of, of uh, small and medium enterprises and, and the extractive industry sector generally, and, uh, you know, uh, because we need those resources for the development effort as well on the, on the government side, and, and uh, needing to, to make uh, the uh, investment in uh, climate more attractive to small and medium enterprises and uh, uh, increasing their prospects for more productive investment. And I think we've tried to balance those things in some of the, the tax incentives that we, uh, we're putting forward, that we've put forward to, to the legislature in terms of uh, certain uh, initial incentives that we give, uh, that we propose to give uh, to uh, certain businesses in, in, diff in particular sectors that we we think are important to the to the growth and development agenda um, uh, that involves reduced uh, in, uh, corporate in, uh, reduced uh, import uh, tariffs, uh, uh, you know, exemptions from uh, goods and services tax, and some other uh, tax incentives that we provide. When I was talking about the linkages, I was uh, speaking uh, uh, to the issue of how the uh, natural, the very large natural resource. Uh, uh, base companies that we've had in the past, and like the firestones of this world, uh, now ArcelorMittal, and how they actually contract uh, for services needed in their own uh, uh, areas. And uh, historically, they've contracted, uh, they've used their own uh, uh, contractors uh, either internally from their own uh, companies or uh, from outside uh, to perform services and to provide. Uh, uh, goods and services, frankly, that uh, the local, uh, uh, the domestic uh, entrepreneurs uh, could also provide. And so how does one encourage them to, to find it attractive? And we, we don't mean by encouraging linkages to, in, in any way, enforce uh, use of local, uh, local companies that is not, uh, is not a choice of the, of the particular enterprise. I mean, we mean working on those incentives that will make uh, using a local provider of, uh, I don't know, of uh, janitorial services or of uh, rock crushing uh, material more attractive than doing it oneself or doing it from outside. So those are some of the, the, the things we want to uh, look at and, and work on. Okay. Two questions here. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I want to echo everyone else's thanks to you for being here, but also thanks for what you were doing in Liberia. Um, and I wanted to return a little bit to what you were talking about, a human resources issue. Um, and it seems that, and maybe it's because I'm reading U.S. newspapers and we like to be excited whenever somebody who was living in the United States goes back to Liberia. Mm -hmm. But I hear about mm -hmm. a lot of people returning, a lot of the Liberian diaspora returning to Liberia to work there, which is, of course, a positive mm -hmm. because it increases yes. the human resources that are trained in some of these things. Um, but I wonder about sort of some of the fallout of this, which is that um, there may be conflict between the returning diaspora and those who remain there, mm -hmm. not only because they are returning, but also in the special case of Liberia, because of the history between Americo-Liberians and indigenous Liberians. 
So I was wondering what your ministry or the government in general is doing to reach out specifically to indigenous Liberians and then also outside of Monrovia. Yes, I mean, uh, we, we don't, many of us, of course, uh, are, are indigenous Liberians. Uh, it, it, uh, the definition of indigenous Liberian is one that is, uh, uh, I don't know, it's subjective in some ways, because uh, what is an indigenous Liberian? Uh, one that perhaps doesn't come from an American Liberian heritage, uh, whose uh, grand grandparents or great grandparents didn't come from the U.S. I mean, uh, there, there, there are many Liberians, of course, that are indigenous, but are uh, spent most of their lives outside of Liberia, like myself, for example. I'm an indigenous, I'm seen as an indigenous Liberian, but am I more indigenous than uh, an American Liberian person that never left, uh, you know, Kakata or somewhere? And so I mean, when one uh, speaks of those divisions, I think it's important to, to recognize that uh, some, of, some of the divisions in Liberian society are much more, are much uh, more uh, significant than those, and there, there are divisions that have to do with you know the opportunities that people have, and you know in many ways, uh, American Liberians had better opportunities than uh, the bulk of Liberians. But we're we're trying to to change that and to make sure that we're trying to build a Liberia uh, that goes beyond those uh, those divisions, and we're encouraging uh, uh, people to come home. We've had quite a quite a bit of interest in uh, in people coming home. I, you know, there have been uh, fewer people uh, returning than it seems. Uh, uh, there, there's been you know quite a few, but not as as many as it it, it would seem. Uh, we've tried very we've tried to put into place programs to attract uh, people from the diaspora to come home and work in government, and some of those supported by donors in working to to get particular skills. Uh, people uh, from uh, Liberian backgrounds in the U.S. to, to start a uh, restart their careers in Liberia with uh, with the government and all of that. Um, I think this process of uh, an open, uh, inclusive sort of dialogue around uh, articulating the priorities for development, which we've really taken seriously in the context of the PRS, uh, has has been helpful in sort of uh, giving the sense that. People have an opportunity to influence uh, the strategic directions that the government will will, will take, uh, but ultimately, you know, it's really what the government does in terms of the programs uh, that it's it's pursuing, and uh, who those programs benefit. And focus on uh, education in particular, and uh, getting uh, more people into school, and uh, uh, getting more jobs, and getting more opportunities for the average Liberian is what will really make a difference. And we think we're making some progress on that. There's a lot more to, to do. Uh, there, there are deep divisions in Liberian society. And uh, those divisions uh, uh, also come from a real cynicism about government and government's role in the past and what government uh, has done. So we want to change, change uh, people's image of government, too, and, and uh, uh, you know, what, they, what they think government can do. And uh, in that regard, uh, we we need to ourselves set examples, and I think uh, we're, we're trying to do that. The president is the biggest example of state examples. Uh, setting examples, I think, is extremely important in Liberian society as well, because we've had very corrupt leaders. And uh, uh, if, if Liberians can believe that their leaders are changing, I think it does a huge amount for their own self-esteem and for their own optimism about the future. And I think some of that is happening already. Uh, we need to we need to, to really do a lot more. There are lots of leaders in Liberia, of course, that are not like the, like the president. So uh, one has to one has to look and work with 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 all of our leaders uh, to to change things. But there, there are there are major differences that we need to work on in, in, in our society. There's no question about it. But I think for the most part, uh, um, people are going beyond those initial sort of ethnic ethnic divisions and, and recognizing there's a lot more that divide us than ethnicity, uh, frankly. Hi, my name is Jonathan Kaufman. I'm a second year master student as well, but also I'm a lawyer who's really interested in land rights and land reform. Uh, so uh, thank you, Madam Minister, for bringing up the topic of land issues in Liberia, uh, which, I mean, I can imagine so many different ways that land can be yeah. issued in terms of um, it being a sort of a kernel asset for people to be able to get credit and start to build economic uh, prosperity, mm -hmm. also being a source of instability, mm -hmm. inequality, and conflict. Yeah. 
wondering if you could expand on the land issues and what Liberia, what you're expecting to see and what the government's... Yeah. Well, there are all of those things. There are all of those things. There are, there are questions about access to land from an uh, investor's perspective, uh, from, uh, you know, from a foreign investor's perspective, for example, because our constitution prohibits land ownership uh, uh, except by Liberians. And uh, Liberians, of course, defined in the Constitution are, are Li Liberians from Negro descent, as it's called in our very antiquated uh, <laughs> Constitution. So those issues in terms of, you know, uh, having uh, foreigners uh, buy and own land are significant and uh, are part, part of what we're talking about when we talk about um, uh, land. But beyond that, beyond the constitutional issues on land, uh, they're, they're the ways that land ownership has evolved uh, in the past customary uh, land, uh, uh, you know, uh, government-owned land, uh, land owned by uh, concessions and large tracts of lands in, in the context of individual concession agreements that are un unutilized land that deprives uh, local communities from uh, access to those lands. So a huge uh, array of, 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 of issues, uh, uh, you know, uh, gender differences in land ownership. Uh, we are in the process of trying to establish a land commission, and we hope to do so by July to begin to start to look at all of those uh, very long-term uh, constitutional and other issues uh, on the land agenda. Um, there, there are lots of tensions around land. Uh, many, many people, of course, have gone back after being away from Liberia for a long time and find that their land that they thought they owned, of course, has been sold five times over to different people and those sorts of you know, uh, individual uh, land ownership uh, disputes uh, go on on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but there, there are those bigger issues about uh, tribal land and communal land and, uh, uh, that, that need uh, to be sorted out. So it's, it's a huge set of issues, uh, many of them, uh, some of them constitutional in nature that it is not uh, solved overnight, and others that uh, you can start to work on in terms of the, the land titling and uh, land records. and. and issues like that. So a whole set of issues that, that need to, to be pursued. Um, hi, my name is Sarmat. Sorry, my name is Sarmat. I'm a uh, sophomore here in the Woodrow Wilson School. And my question is going back to the African Union and inter-African relations. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Liberia's relationship you know, with our immediate neighbors and also any regional um, initiatives that are being undertaken economically or otherwise that are really having an effect um, and kind of where Liberia fits in with all of that. Well, we're, we're actually in a much better place in the sub-region than we've been in a very long time. Uh, we have uh, uh, all, all, the, all the countries that were the source of huge conflicts in the past, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, all of us at relative peace. Cote, Cote d'Ivoire, there's still some challenges. But we're very encouraged by the progress being made there to reestablish peace. So the region is in a much uh, different place, and uh, uh, a place in which we're now starting uh, to talk more about economic issues and about the opportunities for broader economic integration. And we've, uh, in the past uh, you know, two decades, all we've talked about is the politics and the, the regional uh, uh, tensions and, and the wars. And now we're moving to a different set of issues uh, regionally. So we're resurrecting or trying to rebuild the Manor River Union, which was uh, initially uh, the customs union between Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, and in which uh, we've now added uh, the Côte d'Ivoire as uh, a member of the Manor River Union. So we've expanded it, uh, just expanding the Manor River Union in the context of, of course, a broader economic community for West African states, ECOWAS, which is also an important uh, regional uh, institution and that has played actually a very important role uh, in the peace effort in Liberia. Uh, as you know, uh, there was an ECOMOC peacekeeping force in, their, in the early 90s in Liberia that uh, uh, did a lot. Uh, so we're starting to, to work on, on regional integration. One of uh, Liberia's, uh, in a way, behind on the, on the, the overall, uh, there's a common external tariff in, the, in ECOWAS that we are committed to uh, to adopting and to aligning with, but it will take us uh, a couple of years of, uh, to be able to do so. And that certainly should help uh, encourage uh, further linkages, I think, between those countries where uh, a number of countries have already adopted the common external tariff. We're behind and we're anxious to, to uh, commit uh, and, and deliver our commitments to do the same. 
Um, but many, uh, many, uh, many countries in the region, of course, are, have uh, 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 sources of growth that are in some ways uh, uh, similar, and that we, on the one hand, uh, can can uh, build on together, but then on the other hand, create opportunities for competition between ourselves. So. Uh, how we how we work with those tensions is also uh, part of uh, part of the challenge. In the case of Guinea, for example, where we have uh, uh, huge natural resources in Guinea, uh, all sorts of natural resources, and we have uh, quite a few ourselves. Uh, but we have uh, where where some of those natural resources are located in Guinea are best uh, uh, exported through Liberia, for example, because we have it's the shorter distance on in terms of the rail or the linkage that we can. But of course, there 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 are uh, forces, of course, in Guinea that also want more, uh, in a way of uh, a shorter uh, route to to the Guinean coast, uh, and so those sorts of things we uh, we work with as well. But uh, I think the region is 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 resuming the process of uh, 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 integrating again. It's been uh, many years, and uh, I think we're well positioned to to take that forward. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you know. My name is Musa Crawford. Okay. I'm a librarian. Okay. Nice uh, to meet you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the issue of the learning, how transparent is the government on in solving regular citizen problem on the issue of learning? Because the, the reason of my question mm -hmm. is that the past government, yeah. I finally they had a learning. There was a there was a senator who took the took his land forcefully mm -hmm. and then he tracked him to put my dad in jail. And because of that we just let it go. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so I wanna know how transparent is the government in handling the situation like that. Well, those are those are the egregious uh, cases of uh, really bad governance that we uh, that Liberia is known for. In a way, you know, senators that take uh, use their their uh, their uh, role and their power to to expropriate, if you will, uh, people's uh, personal uh, land assets. Uh, you know, those uh, those 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 things, of course, one has to sanction. And uh, where there are cases of that sort of thing happening, we need to to, to make sure that uh, they're uh, they're dealt with in a in a in a, in a very strong way. Uh, I would say that that's less uh, an example of uh, how the government is dealing with things transparency as, as a case of an abuse on the part of one uh, individual uh, official that needs to be dealt with. Uh, in terms of the processes around uh, dealing with uh, land, uh, land disputes and uh, uh, land records, those things we want to make sure um, are done in a much more transparent way. That's, it's a clear process for, uh, for uh, settling land disputes and uh, for, for, uh, for uh, you know, demonstrating, uh, uh, giving your records and for having those records reviewed and all of those things. But uh, there will always, unfortunately, be cases of uh, individuals uh, that, uh, that abuse their powers. We, uh, what we need to do as a government is to make sure that there are very strong sanctions in place to deal with that sort of thing. Uh, so. Thank you. Um, will you join me in thanking our speaker today? And I think probably some of you are joining us afterwards. I want to make sure we march over and on the Thanks. Thank you.